listen as God's word is taught downstairs, young people, you're dismissed. And let's take our Bibles up here, Jeremiah chapter 33 with me this morning. Jeremiah chapter 33, wonderful how God puts his word together and how God puts his work through his word together in our lives. And, and, it's, and it's, it's just, I love it. And so here we are this morning in Jeremiah chapter 33, beginning in verse 14, with this foundation, our wonderful Savior, a new life in him, his new work to, to bring about all of God's life for us. As the kids hear from the word of God now, because they have Christ as their Savior, so we hear it. Look at Jeremiah 33, verse 14. When I get there, there we go, verse 14. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. Real quick, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come. <laughs> what sounds a lot like that, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Back to Jeremiah 33 and verse 14. I will perform that good thing which I have promised. Verse 15. In those days and at that time. Here's how. Here's, here's, here's the source. Will I cause the branch, capital B, branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. Notice that word, saved, safely, safe. This is the name wherewith she, not he, but she, the city, shall be called. Because of the he, verse 15, the branch of righteousness. So we're going to be called the Lord, our righteousness. Isn't that a great way to identify the people of God? Isn't that wonderful? Verse 17, for thus saith the Lord, David shall never want or lack a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Hey, God keeps his word. That's kind of the main theme this morning. God keeps his word. God kept his word. As we look at our study together this morning in the next passage, just following right along with what God was doing among his people. See, this is the context. What God was doing among his people in Jeremiah's day, so God is doing among us today. There is the promise of a new work that God would do to bring everything about. There was a promise of a new work that would take away the old, called the law and the failure of man to do what God wants. There would be a new work that would bring everything together for righteousness. Are you with me? For salvation, those are the words we read, a good thing. And that new work would be found in a person, and his name is Jesus. This is part two of last week's passage, the new covenant. Last week, the new work of God for our salvation makes all the difference. We saw some of those wonderful things last week. There were six of them, and we, we're going to come back to at least one or two of them on our Thanksgiving service. And the Lord's just put a couple of them back on my heart, and it, we're going to expand our thoughts on it in the rest of Scripture we saw that difference last week that the new covenant makes. We're saved and restored in joy and love. Amen. The new covenant brings us into innumerable blessings. This morning, part two, we see the mediator. The mediator. The, the person, the he, who mediates, who brings to bear the new covenant. Who bears all of the responsibility and through him opens up the gates of righteousness for us. All of God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I love that verse. The promises of God are in him, yea and amen. So Jeremiah 33 verses 14 through 17 are the key verses this morning. Jesus is that branch out of the root of David. Jesus is the Lord, the branch of righteousness who gives us the name, the Lord, our righteousness. God sees righteousness on his people because of Christ. It's through Jesus that we have the promises of God. It is through the death and resurrection of Jesus that we are brought into the new covenant, right? So make that connection in a part two this morning. The new covenant fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why we have hope today. The work is finished in Jesus. 
There are two main thoughts that jump out to us in our study this morning. We're going to see the first one. Is there anything too hard for me? Here's the phrase in Jeremiah chapter 32. So we're getting the context. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17. So look at Jeremiah 32, 17. In light of what God's going to do, these are the things we see that encourage our hearts. Jeremiah 32, 17. Jeremiah's praying, O Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Well, look at what God says to him in verse 27, the same chapter. Look at what God says to him. Verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? We're going to see that together this morning. What a great thought. God's work through Christ to bring our redemption reminds us that nothing is too hard for him. Here's the second thing we're going to see. I don't want to push it on the screen because it will mess up my PowerPoint. But here's the second one. Chapter 33, look at verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Because of Christ, folks, we have this great work of God. The branch of righteousness is going to be the title of our second thought. Because God does great and mighty things through Jesus. The, the, the power of God's not limited at all. Number one, is there anything too hard for me? And out of that comes this great salvation. This wonderful work of God that no one could have ever figured out. No one could have ever planned and designed but the, the God of all creation did. And so call upon me. I love these two thoughts this morning around the Lord our righteousness. Is there anything too hard for God? And call upon me. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. Let's start number one, Jeremiah chapter 32. Is there anything too hard for me? Look at verse one, Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah and the people, they're in a bad way. Look at verse one, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tent. So here's the, the time. The tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then, the king of Babylon's army, Nebuchadnezzar, it's also spelled with an N, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, army besieged Jerusalem. All right, so here's the situation. If you do the research on that, the tenth year of Zedekiah, it's only another one year. And the king of Babylon comes in, destroys the temple, and takes the people captive. It's over, folks. This is it. Jeremiah and the people are facing a very difficult situation. Babylon is right now besieging Jerusalem. They're right there outside the walls. They're going to come in in not more than six or so months. And it's this time that the final conquest happens. They're, they're all taken. Only a few are left. The wall is broken down. The temple is destroyed. It's a very dark time in Israel. But notice number two for the prophet, verse two. Start at the semicolon there. And Jeremiah the prophet himself was shut up. In the court of the prison, which was in the king's king of Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. So not only is the city in trouble, and it's, it's the end, Jeremiah knows it, he's telling people it's the end, but number two, Jeremiah himself is put in prison for preaching the truth. The very prophet of God, who is doing the work of God, is now, in one sense, Silence, but not really. But he's in jail. Things are bleak. We're still in the same context as last week's passage. It was ugly. Remember that commentator that we read to start last week? And he said in the midst of the awful reality of what was happening came this bright shining light. It's the same context. And there is still hope. Even though it gets darker and darker. God wants Jeremiah to know, and us to know, that there's nothing too hard for him. Because the Savior will come. We will be rescued from the darkness and destruction of our sin. It's not the outward that is our problem. It's the inward. And God will keep his word through the new covenant. So notice number one. I love this passage. A test of faith. Beginning in verse 6, God comes to Jeremiah while he's in prison and tells him to do something remarkable. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanameel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now, you know the context, the conquest, the context. There's a conquest right there in front of him. Verse 8. So Hanameel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the, of the prison. According to the word of the Lord, God said this would happen. And said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth. 
which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. So God's doing something for Jeremiah in the midst of this very difficult situation that will encourage his faith. It's a test of Jeremiah's faith. The land's going to be conquered by Babylon in a short time. No one's going to own anything in Israel. Everything will be taken. So Jeremiah's uncle wants to make some quick money. And he says to his nephew, it's your right of inheritance. Buy the field from me. I don't want it anymore. You can have it. Now, why would you buy property in a place that's about to be conquered? That's the question. But Jeremiah is told by the Lord that his uncle will come and do this and sell him this field. And what is Jeremiah told to do? What is Jeremiah supposed to do with this? Look at verse, verse 9. And I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. Jeremiah does what God tells him to do. This is a test of Jeremiah's faith. He must trust God. It doesn't make sense to our feeble minds, folks. Don't buy property in a land that's going to be conquered by an enemy. God knows what he's doing. So we can trust God and believe his word. This is what God wants Jeremiah to see and what he wants the people to see. So look at how Jeremiah explains the picture beginning in verse 11. He brings it all together for the people witnessing this transaction beginning in verse 11. God's using an illustration. God is giving us a picture of what will come because the promise of God will stand. Verse 11. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open, so everybody knew it. And I gave the evidence of the purchase of the Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, in the sight of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase. It's in a book. Before all, the, before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison, and I charged Baruch, and I listened, saying, before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. People are looking at Jeremiah and they're thinking, why are you going to buy this field? The enemies, we don't even have food because they're besieging us and they're going to come in any minute. And Jeremiah says, this is what God's doing. Verse 15, this is what God's doing. Possessions will once again be had in this land. The promise of God will stand. God will keep his word. The people will come back. All of this, folks, is to encourage Jeremiah and the people to trust God, to turn to him in faith, to rest in him. What a great picture. And Jeremiah, in his obedience and in his faith, does what God tells him to do. It looks foolish. But he allows God to use him to encourage the people. Notice number two, a prayer of desperation. You get this wonderful picture. Jeremiah stands strong, and he, he does what God tells him to do, and he says, houses and possessions will be had in this land again, verse 15. But then look at what he does in verse 16. Now, when I had delivered the evidence of the purchase of the brook of the son of the rye, I prayed. <laughs> I prayed to the Lord. Look at what he says, saying, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah immediately goes to God in prayer. He, I wrote this next to my notes. This is so real, isn't it? He's like all of us. He has his doubts. He wants to trust God, but it looks really bad. I mean, how is this going to work, Lord? But he knows who God is, so look at how he prays in verse 17. You're the creator. You're the maker. It's your great power and stretched out arm that's done this. And there's nothing too hard for you. Now that phrase is important. There's nothing too hard for the creator of heaven and earth. Jeremiah knows that. God can do the impossible. No matter how dark it looks, God can do his work. Verse 18, thou showest love and kindness unto thousands, recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Jeremiah knows that God is doing his work. He's, he's perfect in his, his plan. He knows this mentally, but he struggles with it in living it out. Are you with me? So as soon as he does the transaction, he goes to God in prayer and says, 
God, I really, I see you. I know you're, nothing's too hard for you. I've seen what you did in the past. Verse 19. Great in counsel, mighty in work. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men. To give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. So he looks back and he says, God, I've seen your great hand at work before. You delivered Israel, verse 22. Has given them this land. You give them the land that they're in now. And Jeremiah, he sees the enemy ready to come and take over. Verse 24. Look at verse 24. Behold the mounts. They are come unto the city to take it. The city is given in the hand of the Chaldeans that fight against it. It's, we're, we're in trouble, Lord. Lord, I, I see how great you are. I know that nothing's too hard for you. And I saw what you did in the past. But I see what's going on right now, God. And I'm not sure I understand. So look at verse 25. This brings it all together. It's almost he says this with a question mark, exclamation point. You know how we do that sometimes? And thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, buy thee the field for money and take witnesses for the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. What, what is going on, Lord? Jeremiah's prayer of desperation. We can believe that God is able to take care of us and still not understand how it will all work out. The answer, listen, the answer, the response that God wants us to have as he's going to get to in verse in chapter 33 is to look to Jesus. He is the source of God's faithful work. Jeremiah knows things look bad and he can't understand it, but he also knows that with God all things are possible. So God wants us and Jeremiah and the people of Jeremiah's day to look to God's work through Christ, the promised Messiah, which would give us faith, even though we couldn't see what was going to happen. Is there anything too hard? There, I know he says in verse 17 that there's nothing too hard for you. And that's what God encourages him to continue to believe in verse 27. Let's have the faith that Jeremiah had even in our doubt and confusion. Nothing is too hard for God. So number three is God's answer of hope. An answer of hope. God answers Jeremiah's prayer. Verse 26, then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah. He says, Jeremiah, I see your, 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 uh, you know, your struggle. I see that it looks bad, and you, I've told you to buy property in the land that's going to be conquered. I get it. But you also recognize, Jeremiah, that nothing is too hard for me. So, verse 27, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And you almost get the sense that Jeremiah... As you read these verses, we're not going to read them all, but you get the sense that Jeremiah just falls down and says, thank you, Lord. As he reads, as he hears God speak this to him, he says, yes, God, I knew it, and my faith is strengthened. There is nothing too hard for you. God will deliver his people into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 28 tells Jeremiah that very clearly. They will come in. And look at the last three words. Shall take it. It's, it's going to happen. And the Chaldeans are going to fight because of my people's sin, verses 29 through 35. We're not going to take the time to read those verses, but God reviews what they've done to turn from the Lord. Folks, God's in charge, not us, but God is also merciful and gracious. So he provides the answer. He tells Jeremiah that they will be restored, verse 36. And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, wherefore you say... Wherever you say it shall be delivered in the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fear and great wrath. And I will bring them again into this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. God gives his promise of restoration. Remember, we saw that. What did we see last week? He promises they'll have a new heart, verse 38. They shall be my people. I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me. Forever for the good of them. Jeremiah's hearing this, right? He prayed, and I know there's nothing too hard for you, God. And God says, is there anything too hard for me? I will keep my word. God's covenant will be fulfilled in verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. God is faithful. Fields will be bought again in the land. Verse 43. Fields shall be bought in this land. Wherever you say it is desolate without man or beast, it's given in the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidence. Just like you did, Jeremiah. All right. Do we see the picture that God's giving us? 
that even though the land's going to be taken, God says, I am still going to be faithful to my word, and God will do his good work. We see that pictured for us where Jeremiah was told to buy something that didn't make sense, and at the end, God says, people will buy fields and property in this land again. Is there anything too hard for God, folks? That's the question, and that's what we want to know in our hearts as we see our Savior, as we see God carry out his work through Christ, the cross, and the empty tomb, all of that, by the power of God, new life in Christ. Is there anything too hard for God? Well, then we say, God, I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to see my hope in you, an answer of hope we just saw on the screen. Number two, then, we come to this second part of this of the picture this morning. And here we get God bringing to Jeremiah the, the picture of his person, his mediator, his, his savior, his Messiah, the one who would fulfill the new covenant. So that's the whole point that God brings us to. God's promise is true, and how will God fulfill his promise? Through the Messiah. So look at verse 1 of chapter 33. God comes to Jeremiah a second time. Isn't this great? Verse 1, moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison. Say, see, see, here's the point. God is encouraging Jeremiah's faith just like he did the first time by telling him to buy that land. Now he comes to him a second time, and he takes it a step further. He encourages Jeremiah's faith by showing him the promised Messiah. He, then, remember what I said earlier? God, what's the answer to believing that God is, is, is able to do anything? He, the response that God wants us to have is to look to Jesus. So God comes to Jeremiah and he says, here's the one, here's the fulfillment of my promise. Here's who you should set your heart upon as the answer for my good work in your life. And that's exactly what God does for us today. He encourages our faith by pointing us to Jesus. He's the yes and amen, right, of all the promises of God. So let's do what God tells Jeremiah to do. In this thought of the branch of righteousness, how does God encourage Jeremiah a second time? Number one, if we're seeing Jesus for who he is, we call upon God and say, God, do your good work. Look at verse two. Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. And by the way, the it's in that verse, thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. This is the word of God. This is the promise of God, the covenant of God. The Lord is his name. Call unto me. You don't think it's possible? Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. With Jesus in view, we can come to God in prayer, confidently knowing that he will do a great work for his glory. That with, God, with Jesus in view, we can come to God in prayer confidently knowing that he will do a great work for his glory. I, I just got to make a couple comments here. Not a great work for us. God, I, I, I'm praying and asking you to do a great work because it would really make me happy. <laughs> no, not a great work for us, but a great work for God's glory. And then another thought here is... The will of God is what God is concerned about. Not Jeremiah, are you with me? Not Jeremiah getting out of prison. It's the will of God that God is carrying out. Whatever that involves in my life and in your life, we can pray focused on Jesus, knowing that God's great work will be done as we confidently pray in Jesus' name because God will do that work no matter what it looks like in my life. Whether I'm in prison like Jeremiah, whether we're you know, living in a country that's turning communist and we're losing our freedoms. Whatever it is, God is doing his work through Jesus. Do you see the focus is what makes all the difference? Call unto me, verse 3. Call unto me. In Christ, we come boldly, Hebrews chapter 4, in Christ we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God, folks, God has done great things and mighty things, and he will yet do great and mighty things. Through Jesus, God is carrying out his perfect plan in my life and in your life, and in this world, and God wants to show us his greatness and his might. Think about this for Jeremiah. The second time in jail, or I'm not the second time in prison, but the second time as he's in prison, God comes to him, what does he say to him? Call unto me. Don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. 
I'm doing my work. Here's the center of it. We're going to get to it in verse 14. Here's the center. So in Christ, we come to God and say, God, I'm going to call upon you. I want to watch you do great and mighty things for your glory. God does do the impossible. By the way, before we move to the second point there, when the Messiah showed up in Israel, it was through a virgin birth where God told Mary and us through the Gospel of Luke, nothing is too hard for God. That's why he showed up through a virgin birth. So we call upon God knowing that he's doing great and mighty things in, in, in the Savior, in Jesus, because he's God, both God and Jesus. Number two, look at what he says next. So we're just going to work through this, and we're just going to point out these, because of who Jesus is, our focus on him, we can see these great things that God does. Number two, I will cleanse them. The sin that destroyed Israel will be taken away. Look at verse 6. All you have to do is make that practical in your own heart. Behold, I will bring it health and cure. And I will cure them and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. Amen. What a great verse. And a great verse for today. And I will cause the captivity of Judah, the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon. Are you seeing the words? All their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. God would do something that no one else could do and that desperately needed done. Again, make applications. This is so real for them in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah and the people of Israel. It's so real for them. Health, cure, abundance of peace and truth. But just bring it into our lives today. We all know people that are looking for that health and cure and abundance of peace and truth in the world. And they're not finding it. We all know the captivity, verse 7, of sin in our world. It's a wreck. It's a mess. But God, verse 8, will cleanse the iniquity and pardon the iniquity. This is, this is the promise of God through Christ. Now, get, we're getting there, and it's all centered on that. That's why we're saying these things. Call unto me, and I will show thee great my things because of Jesus. I will cleanse them because of Jesus. And that's what we need to hear today. There's no other way to be cleansed and forgiven and pardoned except through Jesus Christ. And the world needs to hear that. The world and individuals, as, as individuals in the world, it's a mess. But there is forgiveness of sin. There is cleansing. There is pardon. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus what does 1 John 1, 9 say? If we confess our sins, he's faithful just to cleanse us, to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Same words used in relation to Jesus. Joy and gladness. Look at verse 9. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and honor before all the nations of the earth. When God does this, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. Verse 10. Again, there shall be heard in this place, which he shall, shall be desolate, without man, without beast. Verse 11, there shall be again the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bride, or the voice of the bride. The voice of them that shall say what? Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good for his mercy, endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. How do we get there? Through the work of God in Jesus. So, so here's Jeremiah, and God's coming to him the second time while he's in prison. He's saying... I'm doing a good work. I call upon me, and there will be forgiveness and cleansing. And so he gets number three to the point. How is he going to do that? Because I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow. Um, God makes it clear how he'll do this new work in Israel. Verse 12, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Again, in this place which is desolate, uh, flocks will lie down, the end of verse 12, in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the vale, verse 13, flocks, the end of verse 13, shall pass again under the hands of of them that count them or tell them, telleth them, saith the Lord. For, behold, look at, his, look at his word in verse 14. Yes, look at that, so great. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing. Notice how many times the word good shows up, right? That good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel, to the house of Judah, in those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. He shall execute judgment. So here's the point. Here's where God's taking Jeremiah. He makes it clear. God's plan for redemption through the branch, through the he, the him, the one. It's a plan that God's had from eternity past, folks. 
And God reveals that plan in many places in his word. We could take the time to look at all the references to the, to the re, uh, promise of Christ carrying out the good work of God. This is one of those places that we're not going to look at them. We're just going to notice this one. The new covenant would be carried out through this one. Verse 15. The branch that would grow up unto David. You understand a branch. It comes out of the stock. And in fact, in another place, uh, Jesus is called the root. And don't miss that. The root of the branch of David. <laughs> so, so what's the source of the, of the stock? What's the source of David's reigning and the promised Messiah? The source is God's promise to bring a Savior. And out of that source comes the, 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 the line of David. And off of that line comes the branch. Capital B. The branch that would bring the work of God to a reality, to a, to a fulfillment. In chapter 23 of Jeremiah, he said this earlier. When he was talking to the people about turning back to the Lord and not facing judgment. Chapter 23, verse 5, Jeremiah said this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper. The king of Babylon is right outside their gate. The king is going to reign and prosper, execute judgment and justice in the earth. And his days, Judah shall be saved, Israel shall dwell safely. Listen, and this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. So God had already brought this up, Jeremiah had already brought this up before, for the people to have hope as they turn back to the Lord. But now God brings it up again. Remember, Jeremiah's in prison. The enemy's right outside the walls. But God made a promise to David to establish his seed in Israel, and God's promise would be fulfilled. David's house would endure. God will keep his word. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the angel said that God would give him the throne of his father David, and he would reign forever on that throne. Jesus will rule as the king of righteousness. His name is significant, verse 15. The Lord our righteousness. Because of him, his righteousness, the city is called the Lord our righteousness. God puts his righteousness upon a sinful people through Jesus. So how are we going to have hope? How can we have forgiveness? How can we have cleansing? How can, how, what is the answer, folks, for all that we see around us and for what Jeremiah saw? It's... Behold, verse 14, I will perform my promise, and the branch will come. God will deal with our sin through the cross of Jesus. He became our substitute, and now we have his righteousness, his sinless life placed on our account. He's the Lord of righteousness, and so now we are, the city is called the Lord, our righteousness, the fulfillment of God's promise. And then lastly, God brings it together, just like he did Last week's passage, so he brings it together with a picture of his control of creation and therefore his ability to keep his word. Look at verse 19. Uh, chapter 33, verse 19. I was in chapter 32. Verse 19 of chapter 33. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if ye can break my covenant, my promise, my word of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season." You know who's in charge of day and night and how the world keeps going, right? It's not man. It's not global warming. God's in charge. Then may also my covenant be broken with David, my servant. Right there in the context of the branch will grow and David will have a, a, a king to sit on the throne. If you can break the day and night, you can, then I will break my covenant, verse 21, with David. That he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. No, you can't. So just like God illustrated his faithfulness in our last passage with his control of his creation, because he's a creator, so God confirms his word here with the same picture because he's the author of the covenant. Because he's the, the creator of new life in Christ. Israel didn't come up with this plan. Israel didn't come up with the Messiah. God promised the Messiah. God set in motion his divine plan to save lost people. And since God controls his creation, he also controls his plan and his promise. He orders his creation according to his design and plan, and he orders his plan and the birth of Jesus and the work of Christ according to his design and purpose and plan. 
Here's what the Bible says. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. I will keep my word. The same power and authority and control of God's creation, of God over his creation, is also behind his promise. God will keep his word. Jer Jesus' birth testifies to that truth in the fullness of the time. Jesus' death is the fulfillment of God's promise to cleanse us because he would be the sacrifice for sin. He wouldn't just come and live and go back to heaven. He would be the sacrifice. And then thirdly, Jesus' resurrection is the fulfillment of God's promise of life in a risen Savior because he wouldn't be in the grave. He would come out. Again, all of that's, we could take the time to look all those things up, but that's what the scriptures teach about the fulfillment of God's promise in Christ. His, his birth, his death, and his resurrection. All because God said, I will forgive, I will restore, I will do my work. So what are the two thoughts that I have here in our conclusion? Because of Jesus at the center of God's work, for us today, saved and redeemed and rejoicing in the Lord as God's people, as we remember and celebrate that at the Lord's table, what are the two thoughts that we want to have in our hearts as we rejoice in Jesus. Is there anything too hard for you? Is there anything too hard for God? And in our doubt and confusion, we can go to God and say, I know there's nothing too hard for you, God, but I really don't understand what's going on. And we'll hear God through his word say to us, is there anything too hard for me? And we'll have to say, no. God, you're in complete control. You have it all figured out. And then secondly, because of Jesus, nothing too hard for him. Secondly, call upon him. Call unto me, he says. Call unto me, and I will answer you. God, you're doing a good work. You, 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 brought about the fulfillment of your promise through Christ, and you'll continue to do your work until you take us home. Is there anything too hard? No. Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that this foundation, this confidence in Christ is, is ours. We don't have to come here this morning and somehow work up hope. We don't have to come here together somehow and just find a way to encourage each other. Maybe, maybe something good will happen. Thank you, God, that we can come here together as your people with this confidence and hope in our foundation, in the foundation of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is ours. We have it. It's real. So, Lord, give us the, the outcome of that foundation. Give us that faith that Jeremiah has. Is there anything too hard for you, Lord? No. And, God, give us that, that coming to you in trust and faith. God, I'm going to call unto you. And watch you do your work. We don't know what's going to happen. We can't see it all. But we know that God will keep his word. Encourage our hearts this morning. Through Christ. That's the whole point. I will. Behold. I will cause the branch to come. Lord we're looking back. Saying thank you for what you did. Help us look forward. Saying God I'm going to trust you. Keep doing your good work. Great and mighty work. In Jesus name. Amen.